Welcome back to the Uncharted X podcast. This is Ben, and this is episode number 12. This podcast is a conversation, uh, kind of a mutual Q&A, something like that, that I that I held recently with Brian Forrester, who is uh, a great YouTube producer who also runs a bunch of tours. Uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of his work, particularly in, uh, focusing in South America, where he's lived for a long time. Uh, and also with Jimmy from the Bright Insight channel. Uh, Jimmy and I traveled to Egypt in 2020, late 2020. Uh, we've kind of been corresponding a fair bit before that. It was great to meet him and uh, show him a, a, around Egypt, I guess. It was his first time there. And this was the first chance that I had to kind of catch up with him after we got back from that trip. So, uh, And also he and Brian had, had wanted to chat as well. Uh, so it was a good conversation. I really very much enjoyed it. I want to thank both those guys for their time. As always, there is a video version of this podcast that's available on my YouTube channel. Just search YouTube for Uncharted X. Also posted on my website, unchartedx.com. I've edited the video up to include a lot of background footage for a lot of the sites that we're talking about. And there's one other thing that I wanted to mention in this pre-roll is that I will be joining Brian Forrester on his next tour of uh, Peru and Bolivia, which is happening in August, from August 9th to 18th. There are still several spots available on this tour. If you're interested, you can find more details for that on Brian's website. It's hiddenincatours.com. Uh, and you just look for the, uh, I think it's the Peru and Bolivia tour going from August 9 to 18. Uh, both Jimmy and I will be on that tour and I hope to see some of you there. As always, I do want to extend a huge thank you to everybody that does choose to support my work and the podcast through the value for value model. Uh, I couldn't spend the time to make these videos and these podcasts without your support. Uh, so if you are interested in supporting my work via that model, uh, if you get some value from it and you want to return a bit of value to me, uh, you can find all the ways that you can do that on my website. It's unchartedx.com slash support. I hope you enjoy this podcast. All right, well, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, I'm really pleased to say that I'm joined today by a couple of my favorite people, and this has been a long time in the coming. Uh, we've got Brian Forrester from Hidden Inca Tours. Brian, how are you? Lovely. How about you? Good, mate. Yeah, good. Uh, well, I know we've been, we've been threatening to chat for quite some time. And we're also joined today by Jimmy from the Bright Insight channel, a good friend of mine and somebody that I've just, uh, we, we, had shared, <laughs> we had shared a trip to Egypt. Yeah, Jimmy, good to see you, mate. How's it going? Great to see you guys. Yeah, we had a blast in Egypt. We There's did. so many things to chat about with that. And this is my first time chatting with Brian Forster directly, which yeah. is yeah. awesome. I couldn't be more excited. I, I've said it a million times, you're the guy. I was researching these ancient topics back in 2015, and I came across a video of you at the Serapium with the 100-ton boxes, and, and now here we are five, six years later. Yes. Wow, pleasure. Yeah, it's it's great to get all you guys together, and, and like I said, I've 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 also been talking. with Brian's one of the people that got me originally interested in all of this as well. In fact, he was I first met him on tour in 2013 with Graham Hancock. I was uh, that was uh, one of the first exposures I had to to all of these things, and ever since then, I've I've kind of been pestering Brian on and off, uh, probably for the last seven or eight years. Uh, we did did some interviews with him pro, on an, on an older YouTube channel, and I'd, I'd been down to Peru and, and said hello a couple of times since then. So, yeah, I'm great. I, I, I'm I'm glad we're getting the chance to to chat about all this stuff. It's been a while. Yeah. So I was uh, I would probably start with something that that is fresh in 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 mind, and that is that Jimmy and I had just come back. This is the first time, also, Jimmy, that we're getting to to chat about the Egypt trip. So we we had a what was a, a really intense but also very fun, I think trip uh, to Egypt in, in late November, early December of last year, which was kind of a crazy time to try and do it, but we kind of managed to pull it off. It was, it was, uh, it was a good couple of weeks. It was amazing. It was epic. And it, it's surreal to think that that was just a little over a month ago that we were there. It seems mm -hmm. like, I mean, it seems real recent, far more recent than six weeks ago. Um, but yeah, that being my first time there and doing it with you. And like you said, it was an intense trip. We were busy. It was because what we went to what two dozen sites in two weeks, something like something that. Something like that. Yeah, it was whatever it was. The packs and uh, packed, and it was it was a bit tired some, but that's not a complaint because I've already forgotten about that part. Because it's like <laughs> everything I saw exceeded my expectations. Everything's bigger when you see it in person, and um, but and we'll get into those details in a second. But I just want to say that traveling with you was awesome. You're a great right. travel buddy, and you'd already been to these sites. What four? That was your fifth time, I think. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, and you were just showing and pointing so many things out to me that I had never even heard of. There were so many details on that Giza Plateau that I was like, I didn't know that was there. 
Like mm -hmm. I, like these piping systems and those massive blocks at the top of the cosmic shit that just, you know, me that's been looking into specific things like the Sphinx and the pyramid and the blocks and the technology. And there's all these other nuanced details there that are worthy of discussion. And uh, yeah. anyway, it was a pleasure to travel with you. And we're going to do it again. We got to travel together again someplace. Uh, we are, in fact. Yes. Yeah. That's uh, in fact, we, we just before we started recording this, we've kind of been plotting on uh on some ideas because it's it's one thing that I've always also enjoyed South America and Peru and obviously Brian lives down lives down in Peru and uh, yeah so we were just talking about that so if anyone's interested and I know lots of people on probably all of our channels are we are talking and, and, and thinking about putting together a trip with all three of us uh, down to, to South America and Peru pr probably even this year so uh, stay tuned uh, the next couple of weeks hopefully we'll we'll get those details worked out we'll announce something and and if people want a chance to uh, to join us down in South America and Peru, I think that will be coming up in the near future. We got to make it happen. We got to mm. do it, right, Brian? What are you thinking? <laughs> well, it'll be a pleasure to uh, to explore these places uh, with you too, and with uh, other people of like mind from around the world. Because I've been I've been doing this for about thirteen years, so we have a system down that's very efficient in terms of moving people around and making sure everyone's happy and blowing their minds with, uh, you know, the incredible megalithic stuff that's in, in Peru and Bolivia. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it'll be a wonderful experience. Yes, it should be. Yeah. In, fa in fact, Brian, you you really, it's it's a place that I've only been to once and it was on that trip with you in 2013 That's that's, I think, indicative of the kind of experience you can get with traveling with you and with people that really know like you, you i consider you to be an expert obviously an expert down there and you've been as you say you live down there you've been doing this for a long time but napa huaca is one of my favorite little or well, napa inglesius is the other name that people use use for it wonderful little like crazy megalithic site that's not on any of the normal tourist itineraries it's not something that that many people get to go and see it's kind of a little journey you got to walk up past a river up some train tracks and then hike up this uh, hike up the side of a, of a terraced uh, hillside in the in the sacred valley to find this little uh, megalithic cave that's up there made out of bluestone or granite and it's got these incredible shaped um, shapes in the in the in the granite it's not something that's an official site or anything but yeah that was I assume there's there's all these little things like that all over South America that that are just you know not part of your the regular well-known um, uh, parts of it but but that are mind blowing nonetheless. Uh, you know, it's stuff like that that it just to me is just like this is this is there's something else that was going on down here. This wasn't all just Inca work. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a special little place, you know, Um if you look it up on the internet, most commonly it, it's listed as Nyalpa Iglesia, but that's a, a mix of an Inca word with a Spanish word. And so I consulted with my friend Wilco, and we decided to rename it Nyopahuaca, which means the ancient sacred place, you know, giving it a, a proper Inca name rather than a, a mix like that. But yeah, there are there's still a number of places up around Cusco in the Sacred Valley that I, I haven't been to yet. You know, nothing big. I've been to all, all the big ones. Mm -hmm. But uh, my friend Wilco, my other friend uh, and mentor Teo, uh, mm -hmm. They've lived in Cusco all their lives, so they know these subtle little locations that they want to take me to in the in the near future. Awesome. Still a lot to learn. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, Jimmy, that's a. I don't know if you've seen it. We have had a video on it, but that's. I think that's definitely a place that we, if we, if we all got together and went down there, that we'd go and visit. It's. Um, yeah, a real special little corner uh, of Peru. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Jimmy, one thing I wanted to ask you is, is and I hadn't had the chance to do this yet, because as, as I said, this is kind of the first time we've really uh, talked much uh, since the trip, but that was your first trip to Egypt, right? That was on the tour. Yeah. Like, and, and as you said, like it was a, you know, when you're there, it's tiring and it's usually a busy schedule, but it's not the part that you take away from it. My, I guess my question is, what were your impressions of it? And, and you know, did you, like a lot of people seem to, seem to feel that when you just visit Egypt, but, but you're often it almost immediately tr calls you back. Like a lot of people I've talked to that visit it for the first time, like, man, I, it was just, it, it was mind blowing and, and, and such that, you know, you almost immediately want to go back and, and go and look at a lot of this stuff again after you've had a chance to process it. Is that, has that been your experience? Yeah, it, there was a special vibe to it. I've been to different places in the world. I'm not like a vast world traveler though, but there's different places where you feel better at than others. 
And there was something about Egypt that has such a good vibe. The people were wonderful. I mean, I'm talking the most friendly and welcoming people ever. Mm. And it is something about, and, I, and people can think what they want, but I'm like, there's, there was a vibe about it. I'm like, I could almost live here. If it wasn't so crowded, because I like a little bit quieter, um, and maybe the pollution is a little bit much for my for me, but like <laughs> minus those little things, I could see myself living there for a few months. It was something about it that was special. And I felt like I felt sad leaving. I mean, I was there for 17 nights because I got there two nights before the tour started. Yeah. And when I was leaving, I felt sad. I mean, it's always that feeling of it feels good to go home, get in your own bed and you're back into your routine. But there was something about it. I'm like, I already knew. I'm like, well, I'm definitely coming back um, for a variety of reasons, too. It was when you see everything for the first time and some places you're a little bit more rushed than others, you know, some places you have plenty of time there and you really have time to take it in. But still, when you're seeing multiple places a day and you're doing it every single day, you know, it becomes, some things become a little bit blurry. I'm like, you know, I'm kind of like, I mean, you probably saw me. I was like, like a, like a kid in a candy store. I'm like looking around. I'm like overwhelmed. I'm like, where do I take pictures? Yeah. Which I think I'm at by the way, about 23,000 photos between, I took like 8,000 photos on my <laughs> cell phone because I wanted some, and then I'm at like 15 something thousand on my mirrorless. And I'm like, I still haven't gone through all of them. No. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, it, it exceeded my expectations. I can't wait to go back. And uh, I just had the time of my life there. I remember telling you that when I was leaving to go to the airport, you're on your balcony at the hotel. And I'm walking out. I'm like, Ben, thank you. I had the time of my life. Oh, and yeah, the thing that. is, I've been telling people, I'm like, more people need to go there. Like, don't bother. Go, why, don't look Rome in, in ancient Greece. I'm sure that's all wonderful. I haven't been either. But I'm like, I don't know. Compared to Egypt, that stuff is like child's play. And I say that with respect. But the, the, the stuff that the Egyptians did is next level. Everything's huge. And it's very affordable. I mean, what is it? One uh, dollar U.S. goes 15 Egyptian pound. Mm -hmm. Like you could go live there like a king. And um, and you can make if you want to. There's different ways of traveling. You go on a tour. Or if you want to do things on your own, there's different you know cost benefits going either way. But sure. Um, yeah, I, I just would encourage more people to do it, and I just can't say enough about it. And when people ask me, like, because I have friends and family, you know, coming home, like, so what do you think about it? And like the first thing that I say, I'm like, Egypt's wild. <laughs> it's wild. Good. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you guys are going back, right? Is that all, has that all been finalized and announced? Is that all happening? Yeah. This is the news. You, you announced it, Brian. I haven't announced anything on my channel or anything like that. I was, uh, I was waiting to get all the details and this has just been finalized the last few days. So what's happening? Yeah. Well, we're just, all we're waiting for is for the poster but um, yeah, we're going to be going. Um, this will be my ninth trip to Egypt. So our tour with Jimmy is going to be October 1st to 14th of, uh, of this year. And I think it'll be a great time to go. The weather will still be nice. It won't be too hot. Uh, people's other concerns they don't have to worry about. Uh, most I've heard almost nobody's wearing a mask in Egypt anymore because it's just, you know, the possibility of catching anything bad is basically zero. Right. Of course, we'll be doing it with uh, Patricia Awian, who um, I've been working with for about a decade. Um, and she's with a great company called Select Egypt Travel, who are very professional. They're great. There'll be a Nile cruise. There'll be all sorts of stuff that Jimmy has seen. But I don't think you've been to Tanis, have you? No, we didn't make it out there. Um, yeah. Just with the nature of the tour, I mean, it was, we basically took a group vote and we decided to <laughs> skip it um, because it was going to be like a six hour drive or whatever. It's a long drive. It was a three and a half hour each way. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, so we'll be going there, which I can't wait to see because that place is incredible. And also going down into the Sphinx's paws because we didn't get to do that. We were up in right. the, above the enclosure. Oh, and so going oh, down right. there by the paws is going to be, is in, I in, want to be down there. I need to look. Yeah. In, in, <laughs> I need so to take a peek. Inside the Sphinx enclosure is is uh, is a good experience. I've been down in there too. That's that's worth doing. Yeah, we so we we had planned to go to Tanis and w but what ha it was kind of like a flow on effect of what happened. I mean, just the part and parcel of the risks of traveling in in twenty twenty late twenty twenty was that we we had we had a, originally planned a, a Nile cruise on ours and um, literally two days before we flew to Luxor we we got the call from we also used Select Egypt. And they tried to move. The, the government pulled all the permits for all the cruise ships, 
Uh, so they we oh. had a ship we had a ship booked we had it all ready to go, but then literally two days as we were on the tour it was like oh man this is this has just happened that we they're not going to let them sail, uh, no cruise ships were sailing from what we could tell, and yeah so we had to pivot and say so, all right we do Upper Egypt by bus which which you just it ultimately sort of compounded there was quite a bit of bus travel and then and and towards the end of the trip it's like well we've got a day where. Tanis and Bastet's like a big day. Get up early. It's three, it is a, it is a long bus drive from from Cairo. So we decided let's the, the group decided let's we'd rather spend another day at Giza, uh, which and at the Giza you could spend a week just at the Giza Plateau, just walking oh, around. Oh, yeah. I mean yeah. easily. Oh, yeah. So yeah, we pivoted. I'm glad you guys are getting to Tanis though. That's it's absolutely worth the trip, uh, and it's worth it's worth the yeah, time it okay. takes to get out there. It's it's a wonderful uh, wonderful spot. I did a couple of videos on it. It's um it's some place I do want to get back to as well. Uh, but yeah, tennis is yeah. tennis is awesome. No, it's I found it completely like it's probably the most bizarre site in all of Egypt to me because before that I'd only seen like four really bad photographs that <laughs> had been taken of some busted statues. But when you get there, it's like a lunar landscape. There no plants grow at Tanis because it looks like it was hit by some kind of incredible heat force and just blew the whole place to pieces there are 12 or 13 massive obelisks that have all been snapped like styrofoam Mm -hmm. Um, everything was found buried underground so it's very very mysterious Uh, it's in the middle of a police military compound which is kind of weird but um, i was the first time i went to tanis i was completely blown just blown away by it yeah it me having not been there it looks like honestly just from seeing pictures and video that you posted, I'm like, it looks like evidence of a cataclysm. Something yeah. yep. terrible happened there. It's oh, pretty yeah. apparent. Yeah. I mean, why else is it all buried under, you know, I mean, and knocked over and everything's broken and, and there were massive structures, uh, statues and columns. And Yeah, it's, it's, it's one, well, of actually, most... one of the most... Go ahead, Brian. Sorry. Well, one of the, you know, there are a lot of, of incredible mysteries at Tanis too because you see bits and pieces of broken broken this broken that you see obvious heat scorching on uh, on quartzite pieces and then there's a foot that's about <laughs> seven feet long and i think it was i, I think it was petrie or yep. one of the other archaeologists who, who did the initial analysis and he said that originally you know he found it was either one or two statues that were broken and based on the size of the foot he estimated the, these sta- this statue or these two statues were more than a hundred feet tall, yeah. made of one piece of stone. Granite. And so when you go to Tanis and, and you want to go and walk to the area where all these bits and pieces are, the military just tells, tells you to come back. It's a, an area they will not let you explore, you know, out of bounds. But that, you know, that is Egypt. The, yeah. the key about Egypt is to find somebody who's got a key key to open a door to let you in <laughs> key called backsheesh in a lot of cases yeah it's um oh yeah 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 Deeps. Yeah. Deeps. yeah you gotta it's, there's definitely Backsheesh. a way that that country works but that so that's i did a video about that statue in particular and yeah it was it was petri he, and it was what was probably and possibly the largest stone statue ever made it was as you said over like if people have seen the colossi of memnon this thing was another third a, a, a taller than those and uh, there's they're, they're far bigger than the um, the statues, the giant big single piece statues at Luxor, uh, and and yeah, mm-hmm. like you said, all that's left of it. There's a couple pieces he found of it. There's this one foot, and there's and, and you kind of have this big toe, and they've got this amazing picture. I think it was Muhammad Ibrahim. Your whole whole hand just just fits inside the toenail, like so for, in terms of scale, more or less a similar size to the Statue of Liberty. Uh, just the structure of the of the of the statue itself, and but made from one single piece of of, gran- of granite, and just incredible. You, and that's one of the things at Tanis. You have you likely had several of them, as well as like avenues of sphinxes and and uh, columns and obelisks and all giant megalithic single pieces. It's as you said, mm-hmm. like this. It, it would have rivaled. I mean, this was a place that was like Karnak and, you know, in scope and scale, probably even, if not even bigger. I mean, there's just nothing much left of it anymore. Um, in fact, we I saw something so in, incredible at, at Karnak as well. And I think there was similar statues of a similar scale. I saw something at Karnak. It was made from conglomerate, which includes flint, which is even harder than granite. Uh, what's left of a hand. 
and there's a thumb on that and that thumb was almost the same size as this big toe so if you just sort of work on extrapolating the size and scale of it you, you're talking about other statues of that same magnitude also at 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 karnak and this you're talking like 1200 tons mm-hmm. 1500 tons uh, certainly even more than that with the one piece of stone and, and the fact that it's conglomerate stone is even crazier because that's I mean, you, it gets into the, 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 the details of how to work stone, but conglomerate is in, in some ways a much harder material to work than just granite because you have this varying degree of hardness of the material that's in it. Uh, it can vary wildly, oh. like from soft to hard. So <clears throat> getting those machine surfaces and those flat edges, that, which I think are these you know, signatures of advanced technology and signatures of techniques that we can't explain by the tools and techniques that we have in the in the archaeological record or of what we know of the dynastic Egyptians makes me you know, obviously no. I, th- I think they were inherited but it's yeah there's that's I think that stuff was everywhere like the best the best piece the best the best example we have of something of that scale now is the Ramesseum uh, there's that that fallen yeah. over big statue and even that's mm-hmm. slightly smaller than these other statues that we're talking about and that's just when you first I, I had the this trip in December was the first time I'd managed to get to the Ramesseum. I'd not been there before. Oh, really? And, yeah, and and luckily I, I I was on the balloon. We did the balloon ride over the West Bank, so we flew over it. I think the day before or that morning, and then we we got to the Ramesseum. It was just perfect. It was close to sunset. The light was incredible. The footage we have I have from the Ramesseum and the images is just astonishing and. Man, I tell you what, it, it hits home when you see the scope and the scale, the sheer size of of what that statue would have been like. And again, one single piece of granite, unbelievable. Yeah. Um, it's un- one thousand tons. Yeah. yeah, yeah, at least. Yeah, it's unreal. But besides, you're mentioning like being there at sunset. The lighting was fantastic. It was a beautiful sunny day. Mm-hmm. But I remember thinking, like going up, and you're describing before, like with the uh, that massive foot. And it's like similar right there. I mean, I, I remember taking a photo of it. I'm like, this is Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is a base of a true story. Mm-hmm. It's right here. Because, you know, like in the in the first one, Fellowship, and they're like going on the on the canoes down the river, and they're yeah, passing and by those a... massive statues that are like yeah. this. And, like, and I'm like, that's what it reminds me of. I'm like, just standing next to the mm. shoulder, and, and you see pictures of it, and you see people standing in front of it, and you're like, that's huge. But then when you see something with your own eyes, and you're right mm. there, it's even bigger. I mean, I think most people can comprehend that things look bigger in person, but we do try to imagine in our minds what it will look like just based on those other photos you see with some dude standing in front of it. But when you're actually there and you take it all in, it is, I knew I was in the presence of greatness. I'm like, what happened here? I'm like, this place, the precision of that. And, and, and by the way, how far did that stone come from that particular location? I don't know if it was 100 miles or it was miles. It was something. Yeah, it I wasn't mean, right there. That's right. Yeah, there's Aswan. Yeah. The quarry is still a significant way, even in Upper Egypt. But again, you, you've got examples yeah. of of those sort of scale of stone as far north as Tanis. Like, and Tanis is the other direction from Cairo. That's like, it's a thousand up, kilometers. Yeah, it, that's in the delta from like Aswan. That. Exactly. Yeah. So, and there's no there's there's no Nile River there to you know that's right to shuttle this stuff down. Brian. It's like. Brian, uh, tr- uh, tree trunks and olive oil. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, milk, milk's the other thing. Like they yeah, put yeah, milk no. in front of the sleds. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny, yeah, okay. you know. It, that that that's a good point because that's the that's the auth- of what we're referring to, of course, is the orthodox explanation for a lot of this stuff, which is, well, you know, yeah. it's Saqqara. We've got a scene on the wall where they they've loaded an obelisk on a boat, and they obviously were floating these things down the Nile, and that's how because the Aswan quarry's about a kilometer from the Nile. It's not that close. Even with the inundation, the Nile wouldn't have been that close. And, there's, and, and then that's sort of that's the coverall explanation that gets used to say, well, this is how they shift it, shift, shift, shipped these huge pieces of stone. Now, there's a few problems with this. Yeah. It's something I, I'm, I'm working on in a video at the moment. But the scene on the wall in Saqqara, real famous, on the causeway. I've got plenty of pictures of it. We saw it, Jimmy. The, the obelisks mm. are tiny. They're, they're like the guy's standing next to it. It comes up to about <laughs> his chest height. Like they have much smaller obelisks. They may be 70, 80 ton maximum, which is, sure, that's plausible. You can, right. I think I think where the difference starts to show is when you, you scale up to 600 plus tons, which you have a lot of objects in that category in Egypt. So I'm, I'm sure they were shipping yeah. smaller stuff on the Nile. But the other thing is you have a lot of objects and a lot of granite that didn't come from Aswan. Like Aswan's rose granite. There's a lot of the pink granite. That's where it came from. But you have like mm-hmm. the, the Wadi Hammamet quarry, which is in the eastern desert. There's a number of other quarries. Sinai. 
Yeah, the yeah. Sinai. Right, and it's the mountains. It's mountains, mountains. You have mountains, valleys, Up desert. No, no, yeah, I know rivers, and and again, you're talking about moving blocks of stone, significant distances. In some in some cases, these are 600, even larger blocks of stone. Yeah. And whether you think they worked on them on site or they were finished first, and assuming it was a rough block of stone, you know, add another three or four hundred tons because you know that's they had to shape it yet. Sure. It's, it's yeah, it's a, it's a we don't know yeah. how they moved them. I think it's the truth. But also, you know, they show these theoretical barges for moving like a 450-ton obelisk. What <laughs> wood would they have made the barge out of? Right. You know, there, there are no native trees in e Egypt that you can make lumber out of. So automatically people will say, well, the cedars of Lebanon. It's like, I don't think so. You <laughs> no. know, just, no. they it's have. To, you know, they always have to give a, a silly story that they think gullible people will swallow. And all it takes is, you know, medium intelligence to ask a basic question like, what kind of wood? Oh, I don't know. Yeah. This is the thing. I'll be provocative. I'll just say it. I don't even think they're trying to make gullible people believe anything. I think that they themselves are the gullible ones because they have not tested these theories. Right. They read well, about exactly. it in some textbook that somebody else made up that didn't do it. These are people that have yeah. never been to the gym a day in their life they don't know the the what it takes to lift weight and i'm not look i'm not dissing them because they're not you know muscly or something i'm saying that when it comes to actually moving mass it is yeah. different than most people think and it's not just a matter of like well hold on a second if they could do it for this size then you just add in this many more people and then that's the because that's what i've heard them say i've heard these professors say this so like it's just a matter of more people right. I'm like that's right. at a certain level it doesn't become feasible like right. how many mm -hmm. how large are these ropes how long are they and like I don't know. I uh, I just think that a lot of these people, like they mean well, they just don't. They don't, they haven't tested it themselves, and I think that's what this comes down to. Like if yeah. I had won the the Powerball well, a few weeks ago and it was a bunch of money, like I would have I would have thrown a bunch of money around to get a bunch of these same people to test these things. I'm like I'll give you everything you need, and I'm going to make you a, a small fortune in the meantime. We'll all be friends, and but let's test this stuff. Let's really examine these things to see. If yeah. you truly believe now, after having tried it, that these are the methods that would have been utilized, um, because there's a lot of debate, obviously, we all know this, there's a ton of debate in this community of ancient yeah. history enthusiasts, and I think that we all just want to know the truth, but yeah. clearly there's a mystery here. There is, there is, and I, I think there's a couple There's a couple things going on with a lot of this. One is, it is it, in most cases, they're trying to, to fit all of the stonework into the into the box that that is this here's the evidence of the tools and the things that we found right so we found right. copper chisels we found pounding stones we found basic sleds and we found scenes on the wall that show them carrying you know medium or small sized objects on barges that's the evidence like that's you know and you go to the museum there's these little sleds and things there and, and they've got the pounding stones so it's they then look at everything in Egypt from this lens of well here's the here's the tools that we 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 know we found, and they try and put right. and they just they use that to cover everything that they see and it's there's a there's mm -hmm. a a real lack in um uh in open mindedness on this like this there doesn't seem to be yeah. any room for the idea yeah exactly as a pounding stone yeah, right there the answer. Answer. that's the tool the the one of Egypt that's how they made it apparently right. That's but not, that's, that's there's a, made a thousand ton obelisk. <laughs> that's how you do it, Jimmy. Yeah, we filmed yeah. a couple of people trying their, their best to make some dust. It was a good video you made, actually. I like that. Um, yeah, I and wanna, it's just as, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say real quick, like those stones are heavier than people realize. Like that's one thing I didn't well, mention that little video when I was holding it. That thing is like ten pounds. It's not light, and no, it no, hurts yeah. your hand, and it's right. not even chipping it away. And some people will say, I, I saw some criticism or people saying, well, they would have attached them to wood you know make it like hammers and i'm like well let me just sure. say this that's not what they're telling you in egypt because they made us watch that video yeah produced by zahi awas <laughs> but they specifically show you people need to understand this like don't believe me i'm telling you that they make you before you visit the aswan quarry go into a classroom and watch a video where they show them hitting it with their bare hands no wood and i don't even think it'd make much difference if they if they were no but um no. This is what they're teaching. So if you disagree with that method, then cool. We're on the same page. We we all agree that there must be a little bit more to that story because between those cuts, yeah. between those uh, those um, uh, 
the uh, divots scoop or what I'm trying marks. to say, the, the scoop marks. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, what, 25, 26 centimeters precisely for 50, each 50, and every single one of them? Yeah. Or is yeah. it 50-something? So if they're all the same size, that in itself would yeah. say that it wasn't done just by hands. People just banging it away. It was something else. Yeah. Um, regardless, was... I haven't seen these people actually demonstrate these methods with any bit of success. I don't right. see the round corners. I don't, so, yeah, don't get me going. No, I know. Where's, no, where's, I, where's it's... no <laughs> Jimmy's, Jimmy's wound up now. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, there's so much to say about that, all of that, and 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 the quarry's a good example. There's, you know, there, I was. It, it, let me. I, I can tell you, there's been some studies. So, so uh, Chris Dunn's book uh, does. It, it, it has a roundup of. There's been several different studies where people have tried, and and you get wildly different results, both from ancient, from from older archaeologists and and sort of more modern guys that have kind of pounded away and figured out the material removal rates and how long it would take and how much effort it would take. And the results vary wildly, but you've got a number of real significant practical challenges that you can see with your own eyes uh, when you go to Aswan. One is that exactly what you said, Jimmy, is that the, the scoop marks, and we found this out because we had a couple of people on our tour with iPhone, the latest iPhones that would LiDAR scan things. It turns out that these scoop oh, marks wow. are, of, are a very uniform width. They're almost exactly all the same width, which is indicative of a tool that isn't just, you know, all these guys sitting in a trench hammering. Like, you, you don't have room for starters to use wood down there because these trenches are narrow. Maybe yeah. one person fits in them. The other thing is that these scoop marks, not only do they extend horizontally, but they, they're on underneath the stone. So you're not gravity fine. You can drill a hole maybe this way, but you, you would also be like doing that. this up in the air and, and horizontal, yeah. and that's a whole different kettle of fish with this method. It's, it's, it is sort of patently nonsense, and I think that's why they effectively try and indoctrinate everyone that comes through there. Sit down, watch this 20-minute video. Yeah. It's like, the, and it's the music. Ah, oh, the wonders and Zahis. Yeah. The and wonders also, and, you know, yeah, it's like an orchestra yeah, yeah. playing. It's like, you know. Yeah, okay. yeah. And, and this is how they did it. And go and bang on a stone. And just did all it's the, I call it the, this the national project answer. Like, this is a question we asked Zahi back in 2015 on the tour. It's like, how did they do it? And his answer to things like how they built the pyramids, how they did these objects is that, it was a national project. Everyone wanted to do it. And this is the orthodox explanation. They just say, oh, people would have been felt privileged to go and work in, as a worker in the granite quarry in the, during the wet season. I'm like, yeah, try, that, try that for an hour and get back to me. So how will you feel after an hour of pounding into granite and like not doing anything with it? It's, you know, it, the, that's, it's this whole house of cards that's set up. And I mean, I just the, the point I was trying to make earlier is that I think that there's, it's a modern phenomena with our, our, our orthodox establishment academics. It's, it's this modern phenomena of, of not being open-minded to answers that are outside of this toolbox that we have from the ancient Egyptians, like this idea that there may be a tool out. I think it's, we obvi obviously there were tools out there that did this because we have the results of them. That doesn't mean we found them and we, and we may never find them, but we have the results mm -hmm. of them. You cannot explain what happened. And this is this is something that, that was was that Petrie knew that 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 our older generation of explorers and archaeologists knew. You know, they they uh they were aware of it and they were a bit more open minded to the mystery and they would speculate as to how potentially it could have been done, but they were definitely I think more aware of and, and more open to the mystery. But it's it's modern last fifty years almost that that, that we've got this we know how it was done. It was done with these tools that we've got in the archaeological record, and that's it. And it's like, come on, yeah. you can you can poke holes in that all over the place. Like the whole sled, the sled thing drives me crazy. You, like there was, there's boxes in the Serapium, they, they're sitting on the ground. They were in transit. It, trust me, if they had just dug under the corner of one and they had found the smallest, tiniest fragment of wood or of some sled that was under that, they would have crowed from the the rafters of their ivory towers that the mystery solved. <laughs> We figured it out, but they don't do it because there's no evidence of it. They, you know, I'm sure they used wood to move and sleds, and the dynastic Egyptians did all that, but that doesn't sure. explain the the real megalithic stuff. Um, it's yeah. worth mentioning, Brian. I want to hear your opinion, but I just want to throw this out there because you were mentioning like this is a human thing, where this goes back hundreds of years. Whether it's Galileo, Copernicus, I've mentioned this in some of my earliest videos. Like at one point in time, flat Earth was the scientific consensus. At one right. point, it was they would freaking threaten to torture you to death for suggesting that we or that the sun rotates around the, or the or excuse me the earth rotates around the sun mm -hmm. uh, or that we weren't the center of the universe this was the scientific mm -hmm. consensus this is a human thing 
we have to re- embrace the fact that we just don't know everything. Right. And and it is a human thing to want to be right. And and that's it. Sorry, my dog was. I, I had to move the camera. He was whimpering. I didn't know if you guys could hear him, so I had to give him some attention. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. I want to hear your opinion on this. <laughs> on on what? Well, on just like whether the the. Like Ben said, like the ivory tower, like this, because you've been doing this for years. You have been presenting these things. You've gone to these sites more than, so there's a lot of people write textbooks on these things. And yet here you are, you've been to Machu Picchu 70, what, 72, 73 times, I think you had said. You go to Egypt nine, 10 times now. And a lot of these people, and I won't name names, but some of them haven't even been to Egypt once. (laughs) Many of them actually. And those that have, many of them, it is one time. And um, so I'm just curious about your opinion. You've seen it all. You've heard people of all explanations. You've heard the academics, you've heard, you know, the alternative, you know, ideas. What's your experience been as far as, you know, what the mindset is on, if there's something that you think is totally wrong and they're clearly wrong in some, like as we've seen in some of these examples, whether it's the stone hammer thing, um, what do you think that's about? They just don't want to believe something new. They just want to believe that they're right. Are they trying to hide something? Like what's, what's the angle there? Well, it's a, you know, no, it's a paradigm. It's a boys. It's a boys and girls club. More boys than girls, mm-hmm. and they all collectively reinforce each other's belief in this collapsing paradigm. And that's what's great about the work that what the three of us and others are doing is that we're physically going to these locations, which is important. As you can only learn so much from photographs and someone else's video, but when you go there, you see the sense of scale. You see the impossible stability of it doesn't matter how many people you have working on a project like the great pyramid it doesn't matter how many people you have working it can't be you know it simply can't yeah. be done you know you, you can't move a block every two minutes from the quarry and set it into place <laughs> and lock everything together it doesn't work um, so I think the important thing is that is that the paradigm is dying because more and more people's eyes are opening to what is obvious like the the clear distinction between what the dynastic Egyptians could have done with their toolbox and what they couldn't have done, what the Inca could have done, what the Inca couldn't have done, what the Tiwanaku people could have done, what they couldn't have done. It, you always get that. You know, you get this, you know, everything was done by these people. And you ask simple questions like, how did they do it? And then they give a silly answer like, well, they use bronze chisels and stone hammers and stuff. Anybody with any sense of logic would go, that doesn't work. So that's, you know, that's where, uh, you know, we've all gone through some frustration with this. But, the you know, the um, it's all working out. You know, millions of people are now looking at this kind of stuff. It's, it's attracting more and more people to these ancient places. Because if you can say that whoever did this work was pre-dynastic or pre-Inca, it makes the time frame bigger and bigger and bigger. So you would think the governments would love this because it would bring in more tourism. Yeah. You know, if you say if this place is 12,000 years old compared to five, it's like, uh, but, you know, that's what, you know, that's what we're bringing to the table through our, our common sense observation and videos. It's like, I can't tell you who did it, but I can tell you who didn't. That's right. You know? Yeah. I can't tell you what tools they used, but I can tell you what tools they couldn't have used. That's right. You know, that's, that's it in a nutshell. That that really is it, yeah, and that's that's also a key thing. Like it, it, and there's a straw man argument that always goes along with that for people that criticise it. It's like, well, if you if you don't think that the Inca or that the dynastics did it, then you must think it was draw from this list aliens, aliens or this or, aliens. That or the other thing, right? And it's like I, you know, I'm not, yeah. I've never claimed that, and it's 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 on no, the the, the and it's, it's a burden of proof uh, discussion, really, and and there's a dishonesty yeah. that goes with, with that argument. It's I'm not claiming, and I don't think any of us are, that we know how it was done. And I am open to all the ideas of where the evidence goes, even and whatever that evidence shows in terms of timelines. Like, I, I've always sure. said that it, it either either the dynastic Egyptians, for example, didn't do this work, or, and, and, and I think that all evidence supports that case and that they most likely inherited it, but the other option is that they did which means that we've got our, our 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 understanding of them is completely wrong. Like we have to rewrite the history books either way based on the evidence. I think it's you know I, it's right. it's technologically they were far more advanced if they did do it, and and they had a vastly mm-hmm. different civilization than than what we think of it. Or you know they didn't do it, in which case they most likely, in my mind, inherited this stuff, which lends to a longer timeline and previous civilizations and things. And I think there's 
I think there's far more ancillary evidence now, particularly coming from modern science, that supports that conclusion. Things like the Younger sure. Dryas Cataclysm, things, you know, things like mm-hmm. the extension of the the human genetic timeline. Like this is, you know, we 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 keep getting older and older. We keep finding, you know, new oldest human remains. We started off at fifty thousand years old, then we went to one hundred and ninety thousand years old. And now we're something like three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand years old, based on the latest find in Morocco. And that's just Homo sapiens sapien. You've also got right. Denisovans and Floriensis and all these other types of humans that have come up. And Brian, this is a question I've, I want to ask you about it because I think there's all this evidence for it in South America too with the elongated skull people. Clearly, that's a, a variety of human that seems to be pretty consistent. It's not us. It's someone else. It's, you know, there's, there's other things going on. I just think there's a tremendous amount of evidence that comes from all these adjacent fields of science that support this case of a longer timeline. Uh, even if the academics yeah. don't like to touch it and, and, and speculate on it. And a good example is the, you know, the DNA study that came out. I think it was a Swedish um, scientist. I forgot his name, but he, he showed that there's a link between the people in South America and the Aust- Australasians, uh, early Australasians. There's a genetic link that only exists between this part in, in Australasia and then these people in South America. Does this, this indicator doesn't exist in the peoples of Central or North America, which is really a challenge right. for the established story of history because it means that people didn't that, that that genetic link didn't get there by coming over the land bridge the whole diaspora of humanity as we know it it means perhaps yeah. there were people crossing the pacific ocean way back when you know that, that and this is the traces of it that we're seeing now but typically those guys yeah. they're like we're yeah. just giving you the genetic study we're giving you the results of the dna we're not speculating on what it means for history so it's you know it's the, that those sort of walled gardens of academia uh, in effect, a little yeah. bit. That's and to go along with that, haven't they found uh, mid eastern DNA inside Native American DNA in, of North America? Like sure. that, so that goes right along with it. It's like that in itself throws a bunch of wrenches inside the mm-hmm. the so called known human migration process. I'm like, what's mid eastern uh, DNA doing in in you know North American? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, yeah. so think about that. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it, it all it all points towards this idea that we our past is way more complicated than we think it was, right? And and that's and that exactly. And and there's also this, you know, the Y chromosome bottleneck that that um, Antonio Zamora has an excellent video showing, which correlates to the younger dryer, saying there was a huge drop in male populations all around the world uh, as a result of the younger dryas, because it makes sense, right? That was a, was a megafaunal uh, extinction event. We we are a species of megafauna. Uh, and it was a cataclysm, the likes of which the planet hadn't seen in probably five million years or something. And, you know, we went through it, we survived. And then, oh, you know what? This funny story. This seems to also correlate with everything all the ancient cultures say. It even correlates with what our religions say, that the flood myths, the the the, the fire right. myths, all these stories of, you know, our ancestors going through a cataclysm, barely surviving it, having to restart again. You, you know, that's that's every single culture almost. It's almost as if this is... A way to record information. <laughs> yeah, across five continents, they, they have those those legends and hundreds of cultures. And this is mainstream stuff that they have documented. It's like, oh, okay, that's what they say, whether it's true or not. But it's worth mentioning when you say like that five million years. I think so. In the last, and this is mainstream science. In the last four hundred and fifty thousand years, there's been five interglacial periods. So not ice ages, but periods of yeah. the glaciers coming and going. I'm We're like, in one now. Right. So like five in the last less than half a million years so i'm like what's possible in one million years and, and besides that what would have happened between each and every single one of those periods i mean that's like that's drastic climate change that yes. would have dra- that would have affected humans i mean this it, it appears to me that the earth is a very volatile place it's rather as hospital ha, hospita, hospitable as it is for prolonged periods of time then there's these swings of of weather and whether they happen quickly or over prolonged periods of time, this earth is constantly changing and that makes civilization probably a difficult thing. And I think it all ties into why there's this lost aspect of our past. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, look, whether people can, they can argue, we can argue all day. I mean, I'm sure people will about, you know, climate change. I mean, that's a very political discussion, but the the fact is, is that the, I, I really do say that the, the reason our civilization, and I really believe this is, got to the point that it has is because of the really lovely weather that we've had for the last 8,000 years or so. Like, we honestly, if you go back and all you have to do is go and look at the Greenland, 
uh, or and the Antarctic ice core records that show you like they they basically it's incredible. And this again only happened the last twenty years. This is new information as far as the long story of history goes. But they drill down through the ice, and and every year the snow gets laid down and it gets compressed into ice, and from that they can. They've been getting better and better at looking at things like global temperature and, and the amount of CO2 and other isotopes in there that, that show us a detailed sort of climate history of the last four or 500,000 years. And it was a very volatile place, and particularly like the Younger Dryas. This is how all information that's correlated, stuff like that. But since then, we, we've had a period of calm in over the last 8,000 years in terms of, of the climatic conditions on this planet, nice, warm, you know, warming slowly perfect for life like, it, that's we haven't had a period like that for the last something like two hundred fifty thousand years and that's i think one of the major things that's enabled our civilization to flourish and even through that civilization we've had little various ups and downs uh that and and people don't know realize it but but things like the um the plagues and the and the dark ages of of you know all these things they correlate to cooling events like to cool periods of cool. The Renaissance correlates to a to the you know a warming. We basically once we we came out of of the dark ages. I mean that was a the Earth was cooling is one of the reasons that there was famine that that encouraged disease. You had the, the all of the, the the plague, bubonic plagues and things happened. And then as as the, as we came out of that and started to warm slightly. Crops became more plentiful. We flourished. The Renaissance started. Like this, we, we're very much tied in. Our civilization, our prosperity is tied into the the weather on the planet. I mean, and that's where we just it's we have it really good. Like it's there's no real sign of it's of it stopping either, for that matter. But uh, certainly not in comparison to what happened. You know, the actual climate, like what I like to call actual climate change, which was what happened twelve yeah. and a half twelve and a half thousand years ago. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I have a. To, to, to mix it up a little bit, I have a question for each of you. So whoever wants to go first. One, Ben, this was your fourth, fifth trip to Egypt. So I'm curious, what about, is there something that you learned or something that surprised you on this trip? And then for Brian, for when we go in October, what is it that you're most excited to see? And I, whoever wants to go first, I'm, I'm a bit go curious. Go ahead, Ben. Uh, yeah. So for me, it was a, a couple things, actually. So I had some firsts. Uh, one was the Bent Pyramid. Astonishing place. I mean, I... That was I had been looking forward to getting in, inside there for forever, and as uh, you know, I, you showed in your video, there's it was opened for the first time in 2019, so that was like a, a revelation. It's a very confusing place. There's a lot going on in the Bent Pyramid, and since coming back and studying it uh, a little more, like Keith Hamilton's guides, the architecture in that in that place is phenomenal. Like there's so much going on inside the Bent Pyramid that warrants further study. Uh, that it's I I'm just I think that represents a real mystery. I, I don't for a second believe that it was a mistake in terms of the angle change in it. And in fact, oh. people don't know this either. It's actually a, it's it's in one of the well, an earlier interview I did with Yusuf that's somewhere on my channel. But we talk about it because there was a study done to try and confirm this theory. They actually drilled in because the idea was that oh well there was a, an accident like they had it they were building the pyramid and it collapsed. And that's what caused them to change the angle. And if there was a collapse on the internal structure, there'd be some evidence for it. So they went and did some drilling into it around that 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 angle change, and they found no evidence whatsoever of a collapse or of any issues. So it's like they they went out and tried to dis to, to prove their theory of a collapse, and they, they ended up disproving it. Not something that gets widely <laughs> widely publicized in the in the in the orthodox world. But yeah, between there was there was uh, there was that, and then. Um, and then the other thing that uh, I was, I was, um, what was the other thing that, that I came out of Egypt with that I was just blown away by? Uh, it was primarily the, the bent pyramid, but you know I continued to find things around Giza, the Osiris shaft. I mean that to me was another thing that uh, blew my mind. Just and, place and was it, creepy, and just in this, like I wasn't ever sure exactly where it was on the plateau, and then you see it's right on the causeway between the Kafra pyramid and the Sphinx. It's, I just think it's like literally. You know, it's it's i mean you know that there, there is so much more under the ground there like this is evident i think oh, it's yeah. direct evidence that there's a connected system of tunneling and chambers that runs beneath the sphinx beneath the pyramids beneath the plateau you know i've and, and i think it's all i just i it blows my mind that we don't do further work exploring that or we don't we don't just hammer that place with ground penetrating all of the modern techniques to try and map it out because i can tell you from being down in the catacombs in saqqara and some other places and it's a video I'm working on right now, in fact, is uh, about Saqqara. 
there's a lot more going on under the ground at these, particularly these Old Kingdom sites, than than we we ever thought uh, possible. And I'll stop there and let Brian answer his question. Yeah, <laughs> and and real quick, just to throw in there, because you're talking about the Bent Pyramid. Yeah. Uh, I have a video on it, and to anyone that's interested in learning more about it, go check out Annie XT's video. Apparently, he has a two-hour video on that, and just I can't wait out. to see it. And yeah, just came out, so people I, should check that out because he was uh, in there about a year before I was even in there when it first opened up. So I'm, I bet there's a ton of info in that video that would be outstanding. So props to Annie XT. Yeah, he does good work, and if, I've started watching that video. I haven't finished it, but yeah, it looks it looks he's done a lot of research on it. it looks great. Yeah. So Brian, what do you want to? We're going to October. What's on your? What's number one on that list, or num, and number well, two maybe perhaps as well? <laughs> well, the great thing about Egypt is that um, as time goes on, rather than other countries that are closing the mysterious aspects of these places off with ropes and stuff, Egypt's actually opening stuff up. Yeah. So the Osiris shaft has only been open for like four years, maybe, to the general public, and um, and you know. Going underneath the step pyramid at Saqqara, that's been only been open for like a year or something. Mm -hmm. So, I yeah, I focus obviously. My focus is on pre-dynastic evidence. So I find the dynastic works very, very beautiful. I find ancient Egyptian spirituality very, very nice, but they don't intrigue me the way that the enigmatic, massive scale stuff does, such as. The Serapium, of course, which has, I don't know if, if you guys had the side door, metal door open, because, the, you know, it's much bigger, it's bigger than what most yep. people realize it is. Yeah. Some people think that there's a whole series of, of tunnels that keep going. Mm -hmm. um, the Osiris shaft is absolutely mind-boggling. Tannis is surreal. Uh, going into the pyramids themselves are great. I can't wait to see the, the box that you guys recently filmed. It had the really incredibly precise corners. Lahoon. Uh, so oh, yeah. That's the stuff that still, you know, that, that's why I keep going back to Egypt is because Actually. I can't get enough uh, visits to these enigmatic places that conventional academics basically don't, they don't even look at, they don't try to explain them. They don't try to explain how the boxes of the Serapium got in, in there without there being any kind of, of soot on the ceiling or, you know. <laughs> yeah whatever that kind of stuff and how they were put down into the niches mm -hmm. you can see the obvious sign that the one is still in the hallway so you have the box then you have the lid they're both unfinished so somehow <laughs> the box was supposed to go into the niche then the lid comes along gets put on top gets marked you know in order to finish gets taken off finally tuned and then it, the lid goes on and hermetically seals the yeah. vessel i mean come on yeah yeah, there's. Uh, I, I, I would. You just reminded me. I would add Lahoon Pyramid and particularly that box yeah. to, my, to my revelations uh, from that last trip because I'd, I'd heard about. It. I'd just heard about. Oh, they've opened up this Lahoon Pyramid. It's really cool. I'm like, huh? It's like because it's one of those middle, you know, they say like mud brick pyramid. You know, it's not. It's like it's yeah. it's. I would. I would consider to be a, an Egyptian attempt at copying some of the the older stuff. But again, yeah. it's again, it's another case of something that's. Uh, I think dynastic and low tech built on top of of a subterranean um, uh, structure and and objects that are obviously very high tech. And I think this happened a lot with a lot of nuance at these places where the Egy dynastic Egyptians used these sites and then they they respected, they built on top of them. I think that's what's going on at Lahoon because that box is insane. It's it's a, it's not that it's not the biggest one you've ever seen, but it's in it's actually inside a granite room. Like the whole room is so precisely made it's an arched ceiling the only other arched ceiling i've seen like that's the one inside the the third pyramid and uh -huh. i think that one's made from limestone but this one's a granite room with granite arched pieces beautifully made and then yeah this box that's you know thousands of an inch in terms of perfect and it's petrie when i went and dug up information on it after petrie measured it and he just called it you know perhaps the finest piece of work ever executed in such a tough uh, and unforgiving medium like that's he thought it was the the finest piece of like precision sculpture he'd, he that had ever been done, and and as far as I know, it, it probably it, it is certainly ancient. Um, you know, it's it's sort of mm -hmm. we could we can maybe attain those levels, or we can I'm sure attain those levels of precision now with our CNC machine guided tools. But yeah, try, trying to suggest trying, trying to suggest to some guy going, you know, like lying up his thumb at the, you know, that looks pretty flat and straight to me. Yeah, pounding stones exactly. <laughs> 
Yeah, the Brown stones. Stones. That thing was. Yeah, that that was... thing's evidence that they had more than what they claimed. That I, oh, I, I didn't even yeah, know it existed easy. until you told me about it. When we're on the way there, you're like, "Hey, you're telling me exactly what Petrie had said. It might be the one, the most precise, you know, uh, box ever made, right. or you know, or, or stonework." And then when you're there seeing it, and people had their laser pointers, and they're like doing it from one end to the other end. This thing was perfection. Yeah. And then it's... it had like that slant at the bottom, like to go along with Very like, the room. Odd. I'm like, what's that well, no, so, so it's, it, the room is level. Like, I had to figure this out. The, the room is level. The box appears to be slant. Like, it's it's a tricky thing to really see in there because the perspective is a little wonky just looking at it. But the room's level. The box is tilted. Uh, so the top of it looks like it's built, is, is tilted, but the actual insides are straight. Like, it's the whole thing sort of slanted over a bit, and it must have been functional. There must have been a reason that they did this. I, it, it's, it, take, it took me a while to figure out exactly what was going on, but but you can get it, you can pick it up from Petrie's measurements. There's, yeah, it, but there was there was some reason that they made it that way. It was, it's so precise and and in terms of its relative dimensions, yeah. each corner and each shape, like it, you know, they, this they did that deliberately. This wasn't a mistake, and I just have no idea. What without why. a doubt, there, there has right. to be a reason for it. And then uh, Brian, you mentioned the other thing about the Serapium was the side door. Um, yeah. Not on this trip. So there's a funny story attached to it too. So for people that don't know, I, I do have videos on my channel of going in there in the Serapium series uh, next to like this big rose granite box. There's a big green set of doors that leads to it. Yeah. To a, it's not finished. They're not. It's not finished being renovated or whatever they're doing. But I've in previous trips there, I've been in there and it has inside all these other alcoves and there's there's you see one of the big granite steles that was inside all of the alcoves that's busted up in one area but it also has my favorite box in the whole place which is this massive one of the biggest ones in there big black granite box that's tucked away in a corner in this unfinished area and and i, I show that box on my channel got some videos of it and um yeah so we we wanted to get in there and we would have had not the almost entire sakara staff been sort of dismissed and uh, uh, sort of put on the, you know, put in the sin bin for want of a better term, because of some. There was some. So apparently, at the same time we were in Egypt, there was some, 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 some woman had had rolled up, and she was running around taking these, uh, what can I say, Instagram style risque sort of photos <laughs> at the sites, like dressing up like some sort of, forgive the term, but it's some sort of uh, slutty pharaoh queen, like. It's this big, bust, big, provocative, you know, busty girl that was taking these pictures, and then, Mostly of natural. course, Egypt's fairly conservative, right? It's, it's, this is oh, not, yeah. it's not a good thing to be doing in a Muslim country like that. And anyway, so and also fairly disrespectful to the culture, honestly. And uh, you know, she, so she was, she did this, and she did it at one site, and then there's a picture, and then it, she also did it at Saqqara, and then the government figured it out. And they basically <laughs> shit canned the entire staff because of it, and of course that was included our connection that had the keys to the door. The guys on site didn't even have the keys to the padlock to open that door. But otherwise, oh. we would have got in there. Um, but I did... Maybe... I, I did hear... Oh, one, sorry, go one, ahead. I'll, one I'll last tell the story after. Yeah, yeah. One, one last thing about this, the Serapium is that I did hear a very interesting rumor from some people that have that worked on that site and on around Saqqara in general that, that they may have discovered a whole other extension to that place and there might be as many as 20 more boxes. Um, uh, yeah. in, in, in another set of galleries. So we'll that's see what we'll that see guy what working there said. That's worth mentioning. A person that works there every day, that's what he said, right? Like, that's what yeah. I, my understanding was. Uh, that's worth mentioning. Like, it's a rumor. you know something. Yeah. It or might is it just true. a rumor? Well, I, I would class it as an unverified rumor at this point, but it was, you know, it's certainly something that I, I'm going to try and look into a little more. And we'll see. You know, I, I think there's a, I, I agree with what Brian said about Egypt opening up more, and I think that's because there's been a change of the regime in the in the antiquities yeah. department. And he's no, very he seems very the new guy seems pretty keen about doing this, and you can tell like they they're making discoveries, and and so it's every month or two you'll see something in the news. Oh, they found this, they found, this. and I think it's all trying to build up to the opening of the new Grand Museum. So yeah. it's possible that they've made this discovery and they're sitting on it, and that they'll be they're going to wait to get that so it has maximum impact on the world stage. Because you know when they finally do open up that grand museum, they want dignitaries and kings and queens and all this sort of nonsense. They they want so they're going to try and build up. I'm sure it's a coordinated strategy. You know, I'd like to think that that, yeah. that sort of stuff will see the light of day. Obviously, I'd like to know the answer now if they found more boxes like that, particularly if they're sealed, and then. But who knows? I I think there's a you know, if it has happened, I think there's a chance we'd see that closer to the opening of the the Great Pyramid if they've discovered something. Well, if they would sim 
if they simply let us know, the three of us could plug it on our channels. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, if, if you yeah. notice when you when you walk down the steps to get into the Serapeum, yep. at the top on the left-hand side, I yep. was able to get into that. It's always been taboo. I was able to get into that area. Somebody has sealed off like a big series of chambers or rooms there in relatively mm -hmm. recent times. Yep. So I think... I think that's the location of the extension of the Serapeum. It, keep, it keeps going uh, off in that direction. Yeah. But that's, you know, Interesting. That's also, um, you know, even archaeologists will say that only about 15% of ancient Egypt has been unraveled or, or, or unearthed or whatever you want to say. But most people will then say, well, the other 85% is under the sand, but they don't understand the other 85% is underground. It was built yeah. on purpose underground. Yeah. And that's why you yeah. also hear the stories like from Abdel Hakim Awyan of a tunnel connecting Saqqara with the Giza Plateau because he went through it when he was a kid and all yeah. this kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah, there's a lot more that we could explore as, as time goes on, that's for sure. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's a crazy Something story. Something I... Yeah, because did he say that he had walked? It was like eight miles, like as the bird flies, right? Something like line that. of sight, like eight miles. Mm -hmm. And and people need to realize Yusuf Salyan's father did that yeah. as a kid. Like he's not he's not making that up. Like it's I mean people can think what they want, but I believe it. Why would he lie about something like that? Yeah. Um, I totally believe it, and we already know that there's all this infrastructure under the plateau as it is. Um, mm -hmm. We'll be discussing this in our videos with all those shafts that you see along the plateau, and you see that there's tunnels that go horizontal through them. I got some great pictures. People yeah. can see and think for themselves, and some of them are gated off. And it's like there's things there. I don't know what's there. Um, yeah. I hope my, my dog is whimpering. I'm gonna have to feed him it's in fine. a second. Don't worry, we're not getting off. I don't know if you guys can hear it. Can you hear him? He's like, nah, he thinks bad. there's something wrong with me because I'm talking alone. Mm -hmm. He's not. If oh. I could be on the phone walking around, he doesn't do anything. <laughs> but when I do a FaceTime. He thinks there's something wrong with me. Oh, yeah. He's, uh, German Shepherds are the best. They look after you. <laughs> Just wants, wants to participate. Yeah, I know. I've got my door shut yeah. because my dog's out there too. So, <laughs> Yeah. Something I want to mention real quick, going back to with um, that lady who was taking provocative photos. A lot of people were asking like, hey, did you get a chance to hike the pyramid? Did you go to the top of the Great Pyramid? And a lot of people don't understand just how tightly the security is. Uh, I mean, there was guards everywhere. And when we were there in the Great Pyramid, we went at night. And there was guards everywhere and apparently the story and i think ben you're the one that had told me this or someone told me that some couple went up there oh, yeah. they snuck up to the top <laughs> and they they filmed a porno up there like they banged and filmed it and put it on the internet and that's apparently is the reason why the egyptian government like doubled up their security no and they way. hired like a third party yeah. uh security company to lock that place down like you can't get on the steps like i climbed up one set of steps just to get a picture and they're blowing their whistles at me yelling at me like they're not messing around. Like no one's allowed on that thing, and apparently that that was the reason why, or one of yeah. the reasons. Yeah, you, you'll you'll find that out, Brian. Too. They, they one thing that I've noticed that they did do is they've added a, a rope barrier around the Great Pyramid. They kind of like, I mean, you can if you if you're rolling with Yusuf or whatever. I mean, whatever, hop over and 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 be around. They'll they'll tweet the whistle at you. But and and all the locals are kind of ignoring it and running. You know, kids are kids are on the first couple of courses of the pyramid a lot. But they have added a barrier, and I'm sure when um, when when tourism gets back in full swing now those those guards love love telling people what not to do so um it's kind of a little yeah. i'm like no nah, that's you know that's one of those things you can't you can't quite get right up onto the the first course of it and that wasn't there a year or so ago um so they yeah hmm. but whatever that's that's the way it goes same same thing as those blasted blue ropes at Tiwanaku and Pumapunku right they keep adding oh, more, yeah. more of those things so yeah, they they said it was temporary, and it's not temporary. No, these but things if, never are. <laughs> but it, if you pay the lady who who runs the little kiosk thing, who takes the tickets, if, if you go there first thing in the morning and give her a tip, she'll let you go in there until other tourists show up. Nice. So, oh, nice. Yeah, it's yeah. always That's good to know. It's always local influence. Yes, and timing is is always the important thing. Yeah. So that's why we go to Puma Puku first. The then morning. we go to Tiwanaku because almost nobody goes to Puma Punku. They all go to Tiwanaku and then go home. Yeah, so, so <laughs> all subtle stuff like that. Yeah, that's that's a good point. In fact, I'm still that's one place, man. I still I am still working on a video. I still have Poznanski's volumes here. I have I have managed to find myself his his two volumes and and uh, yeah, that's a video that's been ongoing for almost a year in terms of writing and researching for it. That I will I will be doing a a, a big 
thing on at some point, but there's a lot more to, to, to discover, I think, and, and talk about when it comes to Puma Punku and Tiwanaku. Like, like, Jimmy, you can't wait oh, to, because yeah. you, you haven't seen those either, right? Like, I can't wait to, no. if you, yeah, we all go together, Only you picture. see those places, because that's really like nothing else on the planet. I mean, yeah. it's hard to overstate the how how enigmatic Puma Punku, and it's all one site, but they call it two separate right. things, yeah. but... And it was uh, found yeah. buried, correct? Like, I think, oh, Brian, yeah. I was watching one of your videos. Wasn't it? It's all oh. under dirt, like 16. I don't remember the how much, but like, and it was all found wrecked, oh. and they pieced it back together of what yeah. they thought it should look like, and it's not at yeah. all what they, what was actually, who knows? No. It's in the mud. Yeah. They've done a nice job restoring parts of it, but you have yeah. to also understand a lot of what you're looking at is a, is a, is a modern restoration. Um, but there's tons yeah. of just a lot of the interest comes from the blocks that haven't been restored. Like the stuff that's just sticking oh, out cool. of a wall somewhere where they've been like, you know, clearing. And then you find these mass perfectly shaped, you know, pieces of andesite that are most intricately carved. And this is, ah, we haven't, been, we haven't bothered to excavate this all the way. We, you know, this is just like all the other stuff that we see out here. And it's it just one piece of it's kind of mind blowing in, in, in complexity. You want to talk about it just like, teasing and, and, and blowing, uh, you know, like knocking away the idea of using hand tools and, and sort of primitive tools oh. to make stuff. It's like they were just toying with it. Like there's, there's no rhyme or reason for the amount of interior 90 degree trilinear corners that are at that place. And it's just like, oh, we just did this because we could. It was, I don't, you know, it's it's such a such a strange place. And there's just there's so much detail in a lot of the stonework there that's just, I don't know how they did it. We got to see it. We got to go yeah. through this year. I got. I got to see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Got to get the shot too. Got to get the shot, mate. Yeah, we it's, it's get certainly it. heard that a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's good. I look forward to it. Yeah. So with with Puma Punku, I, I think uh, one thing that that I'm working on that's very interesting about that site uh, is is specifically how it's dated as well. This is another anomaly in history. It's there. There is. Yeah, the Orthodox dating. What's what's where do they say this was built, Brian? It was like fairly recently, like 1100 AD. That's what they well, say. Between 100 AD and 1100. Okay, AD. so in that period, but yeah, it's 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 pretty obvious that there's a nuance of of layers of cultures that may have used that site. But oh, I, yeah. I'm digging into what you know Posnansky's dating of it based on uh, the same technique that kind of gets used in Giza and elsewhere, which is astronomical dating based on alignments to particular constellations and, you know, an understanding of the, the great, the great year, the, the 26,000, 27,000 year, uh, procession of the equinoxes and the way that site was right. originally laid out as he, as Posnansky found it led him to speculate that it may be as old as 12 to 15,000 years old and, and that it, that, that it, that aligns specifically to, constellations based on that great year and one and people he gets a lot of criticism for that idea he's not around to defend himself from it anymore and but but very few people have, have i think really read what he wrote and one of the things that he said was that he was very open-minded um to other interpretations and he acknowledged that he this was only at the the early stages of the science that would be required to accurately date this site and that he hoped that going forward future generations would continue to refine and enhance this this science of, of trying to use alignments and, and and figure out how things were were set up because one of the, and one of the problems with that though these days is is that in the modern reconstruction of that site in Tiwanaku specifically is that they've moved things around so you don't actually have the same alignment targets they've reconstructed it and shifted stuff from the original uh, plan so that's why it's, I think it's important to go back and look at the original records and and of course, Arthur Posnansky spent you know fifty years excavating that site. He's pretty much, you know, his books and his material contain all of the original as found kind of ground plans for that site. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, interesting place. Well, also, what a lot of people don't know because I've been there, I've been to P uh, Puma Punku and Tiwanaku between fifty and sixty times, and I I have oh, the wow. I have the I have the privilege of going with uh, Antonio Portugal, mm -hmm. who will join us if you guys come on the August tour. He spent like 40 years uh, with archaeologists studying the site. They were able to do ground penetrating radar, yeah. and they found massive hollow chambers underneath Puma Punku that have never been allowed to be excavated. So that's, you know, that's ground penetrating radar of the site. And recently... They did LIDAR from a quadcopter, I think, 
-hmm. And they found out that what's underground is much, much bigger than what's above ground. So now the the government has the government has to not necessarily excavate, but they have to come up and tell the truth that Puma Punku and Tiwanaku are much bigger than what they suggest. Right. Wow. Well, there, there you go. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That, that's scientific evidence that shows that it is. There's things yeah. under there. It hasn't been excavated. So proof you, that there's more to it. it you yeah. know what? It, it even matches with the some of the indigenous sort of rumors and, and, and things that go around that site. I mean, Rosemary, I think I put you in touch with her. She's got a, a place. She's, she's sort of descendant from the the peoples of that area, and she would tell you about tales of yeah. where they said there were stairs leading down and there were uh, evidences of, of these underground chambers in the Inti Parka or underneath the pyramid there and that, that that's since all been covered up. Like there's actually stories from people of the, that there were these staircases and things that led down into the underground there, which, yeah, I, I would I would believe that as well. Yeah, I think there's a tremendous sure. amount more work that, that could happen in that area. I mean, it's funny too, it's... It's as I think you've pointed out. I've seen on your channel, like they've, they've, it's a big site. There's all big boundary around it, but by no means does that encapsulate the entire scope and of scale of what's there. You've got farmers' fields on either end of this thing that have these blocks in them from that are clearly mm-hmm. the same origin. These andesite-shaped blocks. You know that place was probably oh, far yeah. larger back in the day. Well, and and also not to mention the you know the little village of uh, of Tiwanaku where the foundations of the houses are made from stones from Puma, Punku, and Tiwanaku. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the church, the church yeah, which yeah, is yeah. there, which is about 10 times the size of what it should be for a town of that size, uh, local people say that's the epicenter of Puma, Punku, is what's underneath the church. church. Yeah. So, you know, an extension of it going that way. Shocker! Wow, the, the the old the old the human nature aspect of 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 reclaiming, renovating, and reusing raises its head once again. It's um, yeah. You got the Parthenon in Rome. You've got the Coricancha in Cusco. You've got the church at 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 at, uh, at, at Tiwanaku. Yeah, I mean it's funny. In, in Cairo, and then you got yeah, Cairo. Right. Yeah. Well, oh then, God, yeah. I mean mosques and stuff built from the stones, you know, from the pyramids. Half the town. Like, same thing in Cusco, even like Spanish villas, oh, like yeah. when the colonial like that. They quarried the heck out of Sacsayhuaman to build them. The churches in Cusco are fascinating. You can just see the, the the different like where they've taken megalithic blocks and tried to plaster them together, and then they've had to use local stone. It's I mean these buildings just have so many different styles of architecture, which is one of the reasons I find it so fascinating. Um, well, another point with that is that um, when you and I and, and Ildi and the others were were filming at um, San Cristobal, the mm-hmm. church. Yep. yep. <clears throat> which is up on the hill below Saxe yep. Um I, I would walk past that every day because that's how you get to Cusco from where, where we were living. And there was a gate that was always locked and it said bathroom. So, <laughs> I, you know, that's very curious. One day I was walking by and there was a guy in there cleaning the bathrooms. So he let me go inside and uh, he said, there's a tunnel or there's a shaft that goes straight down connecting with a tunnel system. So that's, you know, that's local information. And yeah. he said, I clean, I clean all of the toilets in all the ancient churches in Cusco. And each one has a shaft that goes down and connects with a tunnel. <laughs> so there, there you go. Yeah. You know, if there's one thing, yeah, and I know because there's so much debate inside the community of lost ancient history enthusiasts, whether it's the technology aspect and the ages and the dating and all that. But if there's one thing that I wish that would unite, whether it's the mainstream scholars and versus the alternative people that could can, can unite everyone, is that there clearly is, there are things that none of us are aware of that are worthy of exploration. Mm-hmm. And if there's one thing everyone could agree about is that none of us have all the information. Right. And mm-hmm. we are, I believe, entitled to it. This is humanity. This stuff yep. existed long before anyone was alive. And I don't know, it, it'd be nice to see if at least what something that could bring everyone together would be like, hey, where do these tunnels go? If it goes nowhere, okay. But I want to see a picture and video of it going nowhere. <laughs> Show yeah. me yeah, kind yeah. of thing. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely agree. And speaking of, of tunnels that go nowhere, there was uh, – we just had a quick break and we were discussing one. There's, there's, uh, And this is, I think, an opportunity that you guys are going to have on your upcoming Egypt trip, which is – 
uh, going and looking at the tunnel that supposedly goes nowhere at the at the back end of the Sphinx, which is only accessible <laughs> with the special permission to go down and, and stand, bet- you know, in the Sphinx enclosure. This is an right. aspect of visiting Egypt that is worth uh, is worth understanding is that there's a lot you can see and do on your own as a tourist, but but going with a, a group, and this was the focus of our trip in December, was, you know, we had five or six special permissions on them. And, and that's one of the benefits of going in a group is that there are certain things that you can only do with a special permission that, you know, it costs several thousands. Each of them costs several thousand dollars, which is why you have a group to help everyone have the experience and share the cost. Uh, things like, you know, getting into all the chambers of the Great Pyramid, renting that thing effectively for two hours, getting into the Sphinx enclosure, yeah. the, uh, the uh, mm. you know, getting into the uh, the Assyrian, which which we did on our recent trip, but yeah, I, you guys have got the chance to get down in between the pores. That's going to be, that's going to be fun. Yeah. Well, cause yeah. It, Oh, sorry. Go well, ahead, Brian. Go ahead. Okay. Well, another, you know, there are just so many subtle things. That's why we're going to have to keep doing these podcasts because there's so much stuff we can discuss. Oh, all day. But, but another si- simple thing about the Sphinx is that they're in between the paws of the Sphinx. There are a series of planks like in a grid system that are there. And Mohammed Ibrahim was our guide that day. And I said, why did they put this here? Because you have a stone staircase coming down, then you have sand and, you know, stuff. And he said, they they built that series of wooden planks to hide the access to the underground system under the Sphinx. And that what would happen is in the late nineties at one o'clock in the morning, heavy equipment would go up there They'd lift up the planks and they would start doing excavation. And this is from the Awian family. And they'd say at about five o'clock in the morning, all the lights of the machines would be turned off. They'd go back down and leave the complex. So again, it's the local information, which is the most profound because that's, you know, that's local people seeing stuff in their neighborhood. Yeah. And that's, that's where you get these insights that there's much, much more, especially to the underground system in Egypt than what almost any wants to fess up to yeah yeah I've, I've heard a similar story like that that place has been there was a, at some point there was a a concert that they tried to do you know occasionally they do these things this might have been a couple decades ago and they and they basically erected a stage and a and a and a tent or or, or like a covering over the front of the of that area between the paws of the sphinx and for a couple of weeks there's a one-night concert but for a couple of weeks apparently there were dump trucks going back and forth and all this stuff happening beneath the cover of this stage and and after i think after that period was when they 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 ended up putting that wooden floor down because people don't realize there is a paving stone like the sphinx is shaped from bedrock but that area between its paws and and the front of it there's actually you know people call it these roman paving stones there's definitely a a paving stone system on the ground there and yeah, for sure, there could be that. That means that that could be on top of something. There could be you know openings there, and you know these are as you say the A one family and those guys. They literally live across the road from it. Sit there staring. I mean, yeah. use this balcony. Sit there staring at the Sphinx and the pyramids. You can watch it twenty four seven. So I'm sure there that the locals would see that sort of activity, and that doesn't surprise me in the least. Um, you know, when it gets to like all the speculation and things that have happened uh, you know in the other entrances into the sphinx body we mean there's obviously one at the at the rear end uh that has a little wooden grate across it you know that's uh, supposedly goes nowhere uh according to mark laner but but brian you were saying like (laughs) he did spend a couple weeks determining that it went nowhere yeah and there is if you stick your, your head in there there is a metal ladder that goes down yeah so where does the ladder go to you know and there's a tunnel yeah, and does that connect up with the Osiris shaft tunnel system? Mm-hmm. You know, that's what's great about keeping going back is the, the you know, you, first time you go, you, you want to look at all the big stuff. Then second, third, fourth, you start to pick up all the subtleties of yeah. stuff yeah. and objects you hadn't seen before. And uh, so it's getting into the subtleties and connecting the dots as you go and, that's why I'm very excited to be going in October with Jimmy because uh, we were going to go in March, but like next month, that <clears throat> the world is too chaotic at the moment to do stuff like that. But I think everything will settle down, and it'll be fine to uh, to do these explorations as well. If you guys want to come in August to Peru and Bolivia too, then you know yeah. the tour is already set up. It's on the website. The whole itinerary is there. Everything. So that would be a it would be very exciting to be with the two of you in the field. That's the idea. You know, I'm used to working with 
with old guys, older older guys than me. But having <laughs> having younger guys with uh, fresh you know fresh eyeballs would we'll bring the would party be really with good us. for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Stay tuned. Couple, uh, hopefully, in the next week or so, we can we can figure out those details and, and announce it uh, on our channels and yeah. media and all that sort of stuff. Because I know I know for for sure. me, I have a lot of people asking like, when are you going to get down to South America again, and, and when's that going to happen? So, yeah. hopefully, we'll have something and, to say about that in a, in a week or so. And a lot of people, because I mean, as we know, times are crazy. So Ben, you and I, we traveled in November, December of 2020. Which I mean, people were asking me like why are you, what are you doing? Like, what? Like, I'm crazy. I'm like, get busy living or get busy dying. Mm. I'm like, I can't stay cooped up for the rest of my life. And mm. I won't be held down by fear. And everyone has a right to choose what they want to do with their, with their lives. And That's what right. was interesting about our group that we went with, which I also believe will be the same exact case for later this year, is that there's a certain type of person that's willing to travel under these cir worldly circumstances. And it was good mm -hmm. vibes. We had a fantastic tour. Yeah. There's people I'll be in touch with for the rest of my life. And, and, and that's what I'm saying. Like, so our tour is great. And Brian, like, you know, when we go, it's gonna be the same thing. People that are willing to take a risk because yeah. there is risk, you know what I mean? It's like, okay, you know, like what, there's so many unknowns in the future as far as travel restrictions or whatever, but I am optimistic and, um, yeah. Hey, where there's a will, there's a way. And like I said, get busy liver and get busy dying. Like this, this is a profound opportunity to see these sites while they're virtually empty. Right. Which is yeah. what we had the privilege of doing when we went, and it, and I'm convinced it's going to be the same thing over the next several months. That many many places are not going to be, people are not going to be traveling like they once were, at least not anytime no. soon. So now it's still a profound opportunity to go and see these sites like never before. Yeah, yeah. and that's we're offering a bit of backsheesh, which is a bribe, <laughs> has the opportunity of, of doors opening that nobody else has access to because that's right. Uh, you know. Egypt's going through a very tough time, and so there's an incentive for it. There's always a person who, you know, that's what Abdel Hakim al Riyan would say. He'd say, let's find whoever has the keys, and that's yes. how he would get access <laughs> that nobody had access to. It's a little bit of backsheesh, and, a, you know, you get five minutes to go down the staircase and come back out or whatever, but, um, you yep. know, that's how it works. That is how it yep. works. Yeah, grease the skids, cross the palms things can happen like that's that's the joy of, of yeah and, and again these tours using guys why it's so much value guys like yusuf and 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 yeah. muhammad and, and all the people that typically that you would use in it on a tour like that and and travel with know how that systems work system works and you can yeah for a little bit of backsheesh you can you can make things happen which is good and it's you know always you want to be respectful i mean i understand they, they close yeah. off access they're trying to preserve sites when you do it, you do it respectfully, and I'm never going to hurt anything. I'm always just going there. I'm interested in looking. I'm not going to. I'm not interested in defacing or doing anything silly. So you know, it's it's. I think it's all in 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 the in in the in the in the spirit of the right cause. And as you said, Jimmy, I think we all we all have a right to understand some of this our shared history, our shared past, because I think a lot mm -hmm. of this stuff. This is some of the few places where where we really have this evidence for it. There, you know, there's you can't. You know, unfortunately, there's only a few places around the world where we have these remnants, and we, and that's why they're so profound and they're so special. And I think they feel so emotional when you visit, right? There's a weird, there's a weird left brain, right brain connection. I, you know, the, the first time I went to mm -hmm. Egypt, I was expecting to have this analytical approach to it, and I was going to go and just try and understand it from this technological perspective. But you can't help but feel it when you when you go there right there's there's an emotional feeling there's an attachment like you mm -hmm. it, it and that's a, it's there's a profound it has this profound nature that i wasn't expecting but it hits you the first time you really see the pyramids you go and stand in front of them and, and look at them it's just it's unavoidable and that's and i know guys like chris Dunn have had the same experience where it's just like wow there's this connection to it there's a profound nature to it and that's we all should we all have the right to experience some of that so yeah yeah. well said i felt it too I, yeah. it was like and people can i don't care what they think i almost wonder if it's like a dna memory type thing which dna memory does exist they've proven yeah. this in dogs and other animals um i almost wonder i mean it's something it's like i knew it was it felt good and uh, in certain places there did not feel good actually i'll say that and i wasn't expecting it but the cairo museum the valley of the kings and the osiris shaft all gave me terrible vibes and i know that sounds silly some people are just like oh whatever i'm like oh okay well valley of the kings that's a tomb and Cyrus Shaft is a tomb, and like so, of course, it's weird. And I'm like, it's just in your head, but like, I wasn't thinking that when I went in there. But those two places aside, the Cairo Museum, many people said 
that they had a weird feeling in there. And Yusuf said it's like it's because it's the congregation of all these different types of things that have all, each individually have all these different energies to them. And again, some people can just woo woo that off. But for me, I'm like, I felt something in there. I felt drained and exhausted oh, yeah. in, a, in a different way. And it was, I don't know, maybe it's because he had dead people, mummies, right there on display. And maybe there's something off about that. But I don't know. I felt it before I saw those mummies. But there's something yeah. weird about these places, but it's worth experiencing. And I'm, I'm going back to all three of those places. I'm going back in that Osiris shaft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're right. I mean, and Yusuf does talk about like that it's that you don't have – those pyramids don't feel like tombs when you're there. It's it's a different feeling. I mean, no. and the, the museum is a bit like I'd liken it to about. I'd feel about the same. I I would as if I'd spent about thirty minutes in a in a in a modern shopping mall. Like that just drains the, the energy right out of me. <laughs> I definitely felt that after a few hours in the Egyptian museum. There's a well said. there's definitely an energy to it. Well, I'm just that I'm that guy that's like dragging along. I don't want to go shopping. It's just time like to go walking wrong like, along behind the wife. Like I'm not interested in this. But yeah, yeah. Um, there the museums. The museum is fascinating, but you can definitely there's a different energy. It's funny, Yusuf was saying like we could you could spend all day walking around Giza and feel energized by it and just not tired. But then you know in some of these other spots, it's like the energy just gets drained right out of you, and it, it's just how you feel. Like it's it's a seat of the pants feeling you can only experience yep. when you're there, and it's hard to quantify mm-hmm. and define and specifically say yep. why, but undeniably true. Because I felt good in those pyramids. I felt really good. I felt oh, yeah. down. I felt good there. The you know the Assyrian, all these other places, or especially Dendera, the Dendera complex, Temple of oh, Hathor. Yeah. Like I felt good in there. In Temple of Seti, like I was like these places are magnificent. But I'm not. It's not just the visual feeling good. Like oh, I, I I'm all you know inspired by the, uh, the the massive columns. It's something else about it, and people need to experience it. And I've heard it from others, but I experienced mm. it myself while it was not on top of my head. It wasn't like a placebo thing where it's like, okay, I heard you're going to feel weird in here, because that's not what I heard at all. Mm. I was there, and I just noticed <clears throat> on my own that I felt differently in different mm-hmm. places. Mm-hmm. I, Brian, did you experience that when you were visiting these sites? Better at um, some versus others? Yeah, well, I would say more intrigued yeah, more intrigued with some than others. Like the uh, dynastic stuff, I I enjoy. I see the you know wonderful craftsmanship that was involved, uh, the capability of the dynasty Egyptians to be able to do that kind of stuff. But I don't find them mysterious because I you know I can see oh, okay, so they made this column out of a number of blocks, each of about three feet high. You know, yeah. if you have six people, they could lift it up or whatever and do that. But it's the, it's the enigmatic nature of the, of the pre-dynastic megalithic stuff. I remember also, I think only twice so far when we went to Karnak, they had the, all of Karnak was suddenly open because before yeah. that, big areas were, were sealed off. And I walked through this one section. There are these giant quartzite seated statues with huge, like arms blown off, and you know half the face is missing and stuff, and that looks like cataclysmic destruction to me—not an invading army. So that, um, you know, it's seeing stuff like that that just, it, you know, it's a left brain, left brain, right brain thing where the the two can meld together and, and like analyze together. <clears throat> so yeah, you know, this is so. You know, I'm getting very excited to go back now. I was. Uh, I was to go next month, and I kind of thought, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. But now I'm getting excited to go back, and pretty soon I'll be able to, as they say, smell the camels. And that's a sign <laughs> before you go. Yep. <laughs> know where you're going. Yeah, you'll all experience that uh, when you get over there, that's for sure. Yes, and I was going to say, in yep. terms of like giant, the, the megalithic sites that inspire wonder, and maybe we can make this our, our, our last topic here, but uh, you briefly mentioned it, Jimmy, but the, uh, the Assyrian, which is... This tremendous megalithic structure that's off to the side of the the Temple of Seti the first I think and uh, just we and we had the chance on our trip to go down it's another special permission to go down into the Assyrian but if you want you want a place that sort of inspires you know wonder and and just mystery and has that feeling the Assyrian is just that place it's a trip like it, I, I I don't know how else to to describe it but yeah it's something about that place. I mean going down in there and these 70 80 ton single pieces of granite that have sort of interlocked together it's very similar to the to the valley temple at giza but almost almost larger in some ways uh you know no real 
markings, no glyphs. There's there's some work that was done on the limestone at the end. You've got the you know it's just yeah that place. I, mean, I assume you 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 you're going back down into there on on your trip in October too. Oh yeah. 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 That's Good. Definitely worth it. Um, that place yeah. is unreal. And and, oh, and thank goodness for those uh, that couple that were doing the three D mapping of all of everything. They got the precise measurements. Because um, I've always heard like, oh, it could be this way. Though it's approximately these these huge uh, pillars or, or or stone blocks are this tall, mm-hmm. and we got the exact amounts and like it was or the precise details of it. And I mean, it's when you're standing in there, like I said, like when you know you're in the presence of greatness. Like this place was unreal. It was insane, and the layout of itself is very. I don't know what to make of it. Like the little alcoves everywhere. Around yeah. The yeah, very strange. In fact, I saw on Twitter recently some pictures from uh, you know, black and white sort of turn of the century pictures that, that there was a much lower uh, water level that because today the water level, this green connection, and a lot of people don't realize that the Assyrian continues down quite a way, mm-hmm. like 30 plus feet down, like 11 meters is the figure that I've heard, which is like 35 feet or thereabouts. Uh, and you, I've seen some pictures recently of the Assyrian with with a lot of that water drained out and looking down. So those those blocks continue down into the ground. And one of the reasons that there is water there is that there's also a tunnel down there that they've never fully explored. But apparently it connects to the water table. That's why there's water in there now. Um, and they just don't spend any money trying to drain it out. They 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 have a problem draining it out because it keeps coming in through this tunnel mm-hmm. that's that's connected down the bottom, mm-hmm. which is. Funnily, funnily enough, also a thing you have on many many of these other sites, which is, you know, the presence of groundwater and tunnels that go down into it. Like same thing, a Cyrus shaft, right. bottom levels full of water with tunnels going off on the sides that nobody's really explored. You know, uh, Hawara where the labyrinth is. You go down, there's right. tunnels that lead down into the water with shafts that, I mean, Petri mm. explored back in the day, but. God only knows what's under the ground at Hawara. Like you said, Brian, we should definitely do more of these because there's no end of things to talk about. Um, no. Endless. But yeah, the, the Assyrian was one of my absolute favorite sites and, and that was a place that I was looking forward to getting into to see. Uh, to see. And yeah, you mentioned Johanna James earlier uh, in the uh, in the break, Jimmy, and she's she was on our trip mm-hmm. with us. She's been producing amazing content. She did a great video on the Assyrian uh, that's one of the ones that I've, I'm working on too uh, because I had the chance to film there as well on that same trip. And um, yeah, really, really looking forward to digging into that place and, and putting some more content out about it because it's fascinating. And it goes further than people think too. There's a, there's a long tunnel mm-hmm. uh, alcove system at the end that, that, that's like 100 meters almost long that you can, you can walk up. Um, that is covered in hieroglyphs. Uh, it's plastered and then, yeah. then covered in hieroglyphs. But that, <clears throat> I don't think anyone that looks at that place you can't say it's the same thing as the temple of Seti the first. It's almost as if they, no, no, while yeah. make while making that temple, discovered that the Assyrian was here in the ground, and they, they turned their whole their whole temple just a little bit to the right, so they weren't they could they could go next to it, you know, instead of over it. Sure. Um, it's at a whole mm-hmm. different that's a whole different level than uh, than the rest of the dynastic temple. Right. Yeah. All right. Well. Guys, right on. This was awesome. I want to thank both of you. It was great. Yeah. Great. <laughs> thank and you. I'm so glad we did it. And we Me need too. to do it again. And <laughs> we all need to go to Peru together. And we need to make Egypt happen. And when we stop recording, I have an idea about Egypt. I won't say it on. People are get mad at me. People are like, oh, stop recording. going to say something off of it. But like, just an idea. All I know is that anyone that's listening to this that has a desire to go to Egypt, you can make it happen. You can go there or Peru this year. You have plenty of time that in the event of worldly issues involving whether it's getting a vaccine that you don't want or whether it's travel restrictions, <laughs> you have plenty of time to back out of it and not lose a single thing. So if you have this itching to go, because I saw this on our trip, I saw a, so many comments afterwards like, I was going to go, I wish I had, and I didn't, I was too yeah. nervous. Guys, like I'm telling you, get wow. busy living, get off that couch, go. You won't yeah. regret it. And there's something very liberating about going when there's risk. <laughs> When there's yeah. all these other people that are staying home, there's something special about it. It makes it quite exciting. And it's like, it reminds you just how alive you really are. And, mm-hmm. and then when you get out to see the sites that people have wanted to see their entire lives, like, mm-hmm. I would just encourage anyone to do it. Do your research. You know, there's always risk for anything, but with, with, without risk, there's no reward. And, and it makes life so much more fun, I think. So, anyone watching this that wants to go, you can go, you can make it happen.
Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with that. Go with you guys on that trip. I'm I'm also planning a trip to Egypt. Uh, it may be it, shortly after your. T- I'm still look. I'm looking at the end of this year as well. I haven't announced or figured out the specific details for mine yet. Um, but yeah, go anyone like go with you guys. Go. I, I would same thing. I would encourage people to to go because it's and it's also a rare opportunity. Even though it's, you know, you might perceive some risk. Certainly, I'm not sure the rest of the world is always on board with the same level of risk and how we're perceiving it. But um, you know, you, you, you go because there's a unique opportunity that's presented at the moment with these sites. And that's the fact that they're relatively empty of tourists, which really hasn't been the case for the last 40 years in places like Egypt. Uh, you know, there was, there's been tremendous, I mean, <clears throat> seas of people at these places. And certainly in December, when we were there, we had many of them to ourselves. And I suspect that's going to continue. I mean, I'm sure the numbers will slowly increase this year, but I don't think it's going to take yeah. some time to get back to the you know, the full, like, there's a there's 50 or 60 tour buses at this location, you know, like, we, it was incredible. We'd pull wow. up to these, we'd pull up to these parking lots that you could see were designed to take, you know, 70, 100 tour buses, and we're the only one there. And, you know, literally the only one. So, you yeah. know, these, now's the time to, this year, I think, is the time to try and grab that opportunity, uh, even if it does come with some additional difficulties in trying to arrange travel, it can be done. Um, Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yep. I'm. My sympathies are with everyone in Australia and the people that that have issues with quarantines and lockdowns, and I know that the the, the UK has that as well. So hopefully, as we said, hopefully that'll that'll slow down this year, and 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 some of these things will open up, and more people have more opportunity to to get back out there. Because yeah, it's. Uh, I can tell you for for my personal experience in twenty, you know, twenty twenty, man, I was I was in Australia in February early on before this started just got out before it really kicked off came back to the states didn't go anywhere until the trip in in november december uh to egypt and i was ecstatic to to get out and to do some traveling and it it felt amazing you know i think that's a lot of people are missing that feeling at the moment so uh, hopefully yep hopefully you can you can hopefully this next year will bring a bit more uh a bit a bit more freedom on that respect for a lot of people so yeah i hope yeah. so all right well, yeah, awesome, guys. So thanks again. Thank you, both of you. Um, great Wonderful. speaking with you. And we will definitely do it again. Absolutely. Okay, Brian, Cheers. pleasure to make your acquaintance finally. I'll see you in Egypt, brother. <laughs> yep, my, my honor. Always great to speak <laughs> to you, Ben. Yeah, you Sawyer. too. <clears throat> yeah. And, uh, and Sawyer's telling me it's time to get off. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And, and stay posted, everyone. We'll probably have an announcement coming out pretty soon about South America this year, too. <laughs> you bet. We're going to make it happen. <laughs> Come here, Sawyer. (laughs) Sawyer says hi, everybody. (laughs) Cheers, guys. Cheers. Okay, thank you.